when when you're mm -hmm. when you're thinking, wow, this was too hard. This is the, I mean that other question, uh, FRQ practice number three was a question six, and both of these are really kind of hard. Uh, but I think conceptually we can kind of talk through them. So don't freak out if it, if you say, wow, this is way too hard. If the test is like this, it's going to be awful. I don't expect the test to be this quite this hard. Um, I expect them to have one question on that's like at the level of this this whole thing. But um, I think most of the test will be more like the questions that we've done that have been numbered two, uh, three, four, and five. That's that would be my guess. Um, so on this, a um, couple things that that you should note is any time they mention this idea behind functions being twice differentiable, some of the things that go off in my head is that means f, g, and h are all continuous. Um, so instantly I know that they're probably going to, somewhere in this problem, they may ask me about the intermediate value theorem. They may ask me about the mean value theorem, or they may ask me about L'Hopital's rule. Even before I read the question, those are the three things that I kind of go off in my head because I kind of go, wow, that's when we have to talk about something be di being differentiable or being continuous. Yeah, and I would so, think, like, what's the difference between twice differentiable? Obviously, like, you can differentiate it twice, but why would they say it versus just regular? Um, so if it's twice differentiable, that means um, that the function is continuous and the derivative is continuous. Because differentiability implies continuity. So if something is differentiable, it is continuous. So if the second derivative exists, then the derivative is continuous. And if the first derivative exists, then the function is continuous. So it basically covers everything that they could ever ask of you. So that's where right away, you know, from this information right here, you know, F, G, H, F prime, G prime, and H prime are continuous. So I know that those are continuous right out of the gate. And so I know that somewhere on my, when I do this problem, I'm probably going to use that. And I, and I end up using that in both. Um, well, really, I guess I just use it in, I just use it in part D because of the way they set up part C. Um, even though I might have even said it in part C. So let's get, so getting started with this, um, it says on here, um, for me to find H prime of two. So now I gotta go back up here and tell me, what did they even give me on this thing? And one of the things they gave me is they said that this line is tangent to both G at two, and H it too. So it's the kind of idea that remember we when we talked about this way back when we first started derivatives. If you have this, let's say this is H, let's say this is some this is some x equals two. If there's a tangent line that goes like this, the slope of that line equals the derivative of H. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand that? So the slope of this line is equal to two thirds. So H prime of two is just two thirds. And that's all they were asking for. Now, um, Maddie, this is, this is the kind of thing that I, I don't think that they, because Maddie's asked the question a couple of times, what if I just wrote two thirds down? Um, I think that they would be okay with that. Like I, I kind of think that they'd be okay if that's all you wrote is just two thirds. I think it would be really much safer if you wrote that, if you just what, attached that to it. What if you put it way before, like if you write H2 or H prime of two, do you know what I'm saying? Like if they don't equal, but they're both there. Um, as long as you've committed to the value that you're, answering h prime of two to be two thirds. 
I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily need that graph that I drew, and I don't even really need to to write m equals two thirds. Um, I actually think that if I had my paper over here and I just wrote two thirds, I think they'd probably give me credit for it. Can't you also use just like proving with like the tangent line equation? Like you could write like y equals f prime. Like the way it's written is the exact same. The way the tangent line is written is the same as the way oh. the tangent yeah. equation is. Like could you just prove? You could. All, all they're really looking for is did you, did you get two-thirds? Okay. I mean, if you have two-thirds, that, that's all you really need. So any questions on that? Okay. So then um, I left the stem of the problem on here, but part B says um, let A be the function uh, A of X equals 3X cubed times H of X, write an expression for A prime of X, and then find A prime of 2. Um, so here's a situation where um, this is the, why I think they assign this. Because I can't take a program like PhotoMath and ask it to find a prime of x because it's all mixed up. PhotoMath is really good symbolically to, to do derivatives, but it doesn't do anything when you give a generic function. And I think that's why they asked us to kind of take a look at this question. So if you think about this, as soon as you see this and you see right there that there is a times in there, It's a product rule question. It's just like the one we went over this morning. Um, in, the, in this morning's, there was a product rule also, and I kind of highlighted the product rule in there. Um, so, you know, clearly they're saying try to make sure you know how to do the product rule. I think when, when I did the miscellaneous question packet um, a couple weeks ago, I think I gave a couple of problems similar to this one um, previously. So if you if you want more practice, you can go back and look at that. But what I would write is I'd write, well, then a prime of x is equal to 9x squared times h of x plus 3x cubed times h prime of x. And that's, that's the first thing. That's the expression. Um, that's going to be worth... Um, two or three points, just that expression, because they're trying to figure out, do you know how to take derivatives? Do you know how to do the product rule? Um, so it's clearly worth one, worth one point. It may be worth two points on this one. Then what we're gonna do, and I, if I were doing this, I probably would have written it out in two steps, is I would have said, okay, well now I'm supposed to find a prime of two, and a prime of two is nine times two squared times h of two, plus three times two cubed times h prime of two. Now, you don't get any credit for that because that's not, um, you do have to simplify this. And, and what I mean by simplify is you do have to put in values for h of two and h prime of two. A lot of times on these problems, parts B um, come from parts A. Um, just so you know if this is the second FRQ or if you've done some other work, you may have already covered something. Like we already actually figured out what H prime of 2 was. Mm -hmm. So I think the answer that they were looking, that they would be really okay with you writing, is notice up here they told you H of 2 is equal to 4. Whoops, I don't even know why I wrote 9 there. It should have been 2 squared. Um, so this is 4 plus 3 times 2 cubed, and then this is 2 thirds because we already found that. Now don't simplify it. You know, now I'm not going to simplify it. That's arithmetic. I don't have to simplify it, and, and I've done it. So technically, the green line and the second of the two blue lines is what you need for this. Any questions on that? Okay, then, then this problem got significantly more difficult as soon as we jumped to part, to part C. Um, part C got significantly more difficult, and, um, 
And the idea behind part C, when I started reading it, I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is a whole new level of difficulty. But um, what I was looking for is a couple things that I looked for is, um, let's see. Um, when I, when I kind of looked at this is I said, okay, well, here's this function H and we're looking, you know, we're kind of centering around this value too. It's kind of this part of the whole problem. Um, it also says that H can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule. That means because they told you it can be evaluated using L'Hopital's rule, I don't know that you need to like reference L'Hopital's rule that you're using it, that it is valuable uh, or that, that you do have to like formally show that L'Hopital's rule can work. You just know that it can be. Um, the idea behind that piece is that means the limit as um, X goes towards two of X squared minus four over one minus f of x cubed is equal to the limit as x goes towards 2 of 2x over, um, now if I differentiate the denominator on this, I get negative 3 times f of x squared times f prime of x because of that wonderful chain rule that you all love so much. That's what L'Hopital's rule says. They said you can use L'Hopital's rule. It says it is known that it can be done. So you don't have to state the normal conditions of L'Hopital's rule on this one. But I would put that, I would have put that down on my paper. So as soon as I saw that, that was an important piece. Um, so now what this is looking for is notice that this is also the same thing as h of 2 because h is continuous. Because h is continuous, that has to be true, right? Now, this goes back to like at the beginning when it said that h was a twice differentiable function. Now h is continuous. So all the three of those things are equal. Why would it not be equal to h prime of two? Uh, it would, um, it, because um, it says to use this limit to evaluate these two things. And, and um, it's not equal to h prime because h prime and h are not equal. Well, I know that, but like, I'll talk about it later, but I like solved for f of two, and then I was trying to solve for like f prime of two and use, I used h prime of x instead of h. Yeah, so so it, it's because h of two, and so it starts talking about um, this function h and doesn't really talk about h prime, because if we were really gonna find h prime, Claire, looking up here at h, we would have to use the quotient rule, and we oh, haven't even used the yeah. quotient rule on this. Okay. So, so now one of the things that we're told up here is h of two is equal to four. So what that means is, is that means that both of those limits equal four, right? That means that that we know. Um, we know a couple things on here, and I'm gonna maybe write, try to write a little bit smaller, but we know that the limit as x goes towards two of x squared minus four divided by one minus f of x cubed is equal to four, right? And if that's true, then we can plug in two into this thing, and we know that um, we know that um, 
one of the, oh, one of the things we know is is if you plug in two, what what happens to the numerator is you get zero on the top. Well, what do you what should you get on the bottom based on L'Hopital's rule? Zero. Anybody want to tell me? Zero. You should get zero. You should get zero because of L'Hopital's rule. Because of L'Hopital's rule, 1 minus f of x cubed has to equal 0. And, and that's when, when f goes to um, when f goes to 2. That has to be 0. If L'Hopital's rule works for this limit, if, it can't, if h of x can be evaluated in L'Hopital's rule, then that means when we put in two, we ought to get zero on the top and zero on the bottom. So if that's true, then what f of two must equal is one, because that's the only thing that can that would satisfy that equation. Does that make sense? Hopefully, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so that means you know what what that equals. Now, you know that this whole thing equals four. So if that whole thing equals four, we're gonna kinda hone in on this piece right here. And I've run out of a little bit of room, so I'm gonna see if I can, uh, actually I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna write it out. So what we have, what we're looking at is the limit as x goes towards 2 of 2x over negative 3 times f of x squared times f prime of x is equal to 4. And we also just established that f of 2 was equal to 1. So that's what we've established at this point. Is everybody okay with that? So bringing those two circled pieces down below, this is what we have. Now what that means is that means if we plug in two, we should get that. What does that mean the denominator needs to equal? Anybody want to tell me? Nobody wants to say? One. It means it equals one. If you look at the numerator, the numerator is four, right? The denominator then has to be one, right? I mean, because this is divided by one. So negative three times f of two squared times f prime of 2 has to equal 1. Well, we already know that that's 1 from our other work. So that means f prime of 2 has to be negative 1 third. And that's our two values. That's the two values they asked us to find in this problem. They asked us to find... Um, Way back up here, we were asked to find two values. We were asked to find um, those two things. Find f of 2, which we found that that was 1, and f prime of 2, and now we established that that was 1 third. And all of this work had to be in there. Um, pretty, pretty difficult question. Um, I think the way that was worded was pretty difficult. Um, I... Way I can look and see what they gave credit for. So I didn't even look at that. Um, one second, let me pull that up. Um, so, 
So that part was worth, um, that part was worth four points. And if you look at the things that I wrote on here, um, this whole thing equals four. That's what I wrote right here. That was that work when I wrote that that equals four. My value for f of two, which is right there. Um, L'Hopital's rule, which is this whole thing right here. That's Lopi, That's me showing that I know how to do L'Hopital's rule. And then f of two is that value, um, uh, negative one third. So those are the, the, the four things that were asked about that. Um, notice that on this problem, four points were given for part A and B and only five were given for part C and D. So, um, and part D, even though it's, um, it's kind of hard to, to do and we haven't really actually even covered the topic, um, it's, uh, it was only worth one point. And so that's why I even, when I said, I don't think they'll put it on the exam this year, I, I'd have a hard time believing they put it on there. Um, so they use this idea, if you looked at the answer key, they use this idea of called the squeeze theorem, and it's it's highlighted right there. Um, and, and basically the squeeze theorem says that if you have um, a function k that's bounded above by one function that we know and below by another function that we know, then it has to behave exactly like g and, and h. This function k has to be kind of smushed in between the other two. It has to behave like it. Um, it has to act like it. It has to have all the characteristics that the other one has. And it's co it's called the squeeze theorem. It's, it's because it's kind of um, trapped in between two functions. So it has to be that same. It has to have all the characteristics of that function. Um, it's, um, I guess I would even kind of add it to the fact that, you know, um, we are products of our parents, right? I mean, if 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 you get a little bit from each each parent, and that's who may who you are, even with even if you don't like it, um, you know, I, you you are smushed in between them. They make you up. So this function k, think of that as the student, and g of x and h of x are the parents. We're not going to talk about who's greater, who's less, but it's probably the dads over here. Um, anyway, the uh, but they behave exactly the same. So when you look at this question and it starts talking about this and it says on here, if I highlight some important things, it says it's known that this is true. So as soon as I read that, I was like, oh crap, I gotta make sure I cover the squeeze theorem with them. I, I wasn't really going to until AP came out last week and said, cover this problem because I didn't, th I don't think they'll put it on the exam this year. Um, I had intentions of, of reviewing it before this whole um, distance learning thing came. But then it says, let K be a function so that it's smushed in between those two. So if you see this type of terminology, know that um, the squeeze theorem is probably gonna be used. Um, that's that's the signal that says, wow, this this function is sandwiched in between the other ones. Then it asks, you know, is it is K continuous? Remember, way back at the beginning, I said, as soon as I read this, I know I'm going to have to talk about continuity in this problem. As soon as I read that it's differentiable, I know that this function um, that 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 it has to be continuous. And so what I would do, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, is what I would say is I would have said something along these lines. I would have said, um, since g of x and h of x are continuous, Um, at x equals 2, then g of 2 is equal to the limit as x goes towards 2 from the left-hand side. 
is equal to the limit as x goes towards 2 from the right-hand side. That's true. And h of 2 is equal to the limit as x goes towards 2 from the left-hand side of h of x, which is equal to the limit as x goes towards 2 from the right-hand side of h of x. Therefore, by the squeeze theorem, h or k is continuous at x equals 2. That's, what I admit. That's worth one point. You we probably had to reference. Oh, sorry. You probably had to reference the squeeze theorem. Um, and technically, they would have been. I didn't grade this question, but I think they would have been pretty. Especially looking at this, I didn't grade this one last year, so I wasn't even really, um, and I wasn't attached to the flow on this question, so I never even really saw how they were, um, how they graded it. Um, but on some level, you had to have some of this information that I just, not the top part that I highlighted in blue, some of that information in there, it's not, not that part up there, but this stuff down here. Um, you would have had to have some of that stuff in Part D. It was only worth one point. Um, it would have been what they called a, a, a firm point where they would have said, you know, that one you got to be pretty perfect. And in, in an exam that there's 108 questions or 108 points to be had, um, it would have been okay to miss this one and still get a five. Um, that's why I don't, I don't, I don't see them – asking a question about part D that, that's that difficult in on the exam tomorrow. I just don't see how they can justify um, spending a point on that exam, on, on tomorrow's exam, because it's so much shorter. You know, you're, you're dealing with a, an exam that's a quarter of the length of a normal exam. You know, 75% of the exam questions are thrown out because they only are doing 25% of the exam. Still the same content, but only 25% of the questions in a normal exam. So how do they ask this? Some, how, do they, how do you waste something like this? Because if we waste something like this, chances are there's a, there's, there's a problem that, we, that they wouldn't be able to ask that they want to. So I just don't see it asked. I mean, I could eat my words on that one, but now if you have this next to you, um, you know, maybe you could fudge your way to the answer, especially if you, you know, printed this out. And then if you had, if you saw this and recognized it, you could kind of copy the same idea down, um, you know, as, as part of the notes. Um, you know, it wouldn't be the same numbers or anything, but you'd have to just recognize it. I, I don't think, I just don't think they're going to put it on there, but, I, you know, who, who, I don't know. Any questions on that? Pretty hard. I mean, I, I'm not going to kid you. I think on this question, I think part D is hard. I think part C you know, you look at these these points. You maybe could have fudged your way to a couple of those points if you kind of kind of just threw something on uh, at the paper and and maybe you wrote this down because you knew what L'Hopital's rule meant. Well, shoot, that was worth a point. Uh, maybe then you that slid you into other things. Um, parts A and B. Um, that's kind of where I think they were going with why they wanted us to look at that problem because I think those are are really doable. And if you if you look back, um, that was worth four points. Um, and they and there's nothing really super difficult about that part. Um, you know, that's all stuff that we've covered before. Know the chain rule, know the product rule, know that the derivative is the same thing as a slope and 
and, and that kind of stuff. Any questions on that or anything? I had a question on first response, question five, or no, four, six. Okay, one second. 